The reading this morning, the second reading, is by Barbara Kingsolver. In my own worst seasons, she writes, I've come back from the colorless world of despair by forcing myself to look hard for a long time at a single glorious thing, a flame of red geranium outside my bedroom window, and then another, my daughter in a yellow dress, and then another, the perfect outline of a full dark sphere behind the crescent moon. Until I learn to be in love with my life again, like a stroke victim retraining new parts of the brain to grasp lost skills, I have taught myself joy over and over and over again. Well, I think I'm used to Zoom, but I have to say it's really nice to see you this morning. Yay. And I, look, I see you too on Zoom, people. So this is good. This is good. We take a turn now into February, perhaps the heart of winter with more snow, or perhaps not. Who knows what the next few weeks will bring. In the Christian liturgical calendar, it is Candlemas a festival for blessing candles in the church. And reading the story that Sarah read today about the presentation in the, in the temple. 40 days after Jesus's birth, his parents bring him to Jerusalem where they encounter the elderly Anna and Simeon waiting in hope of a Messiah that would be born, a hope of a new age that would be born. Let now thy servant depart in peace, Simeon says, basically saying, now that I've seen the Messiah, I can die in peace. His words are a famous text in the Christian canon, often a blessing for someone who is dying. We get to hear Simeon, but we don't get to hear Anna. She's the only woman that the New Testament actually names as prophet, but we don't know what she actually says, just that she prays God and speaks about the child, but unfortunately, we are not given her actual words. Another, long line, another in a long line of women in scripture who are effectively silenced by the authors, made invisible in sacred text. But thanks to feminist theologians and new biblical scholars coming along, there are lots of ways now to reconstruct and reclaim these women's voices. I wonder, I've been thinking this week, the lost words of Anna, what would they have been? In the Celtic earth-centered tradition, February one or two is the day to celebrate Brigid. Born in 453 in Ireland, supposedly, Brigid has long been associated with healing, poetry, the arts, and smith work. And after Christianity came to the British Isles around the fifth century, Brigid the goddess became Brigid the saint. She refused to marry despite her father's wish that she do so, but she chose to live at home as a virgin, sewing tapestries and vestments for her church, and later founded monastic communities where women who wanted to remain unmarried could live. They became centers for art and literature, and her abbey in Kildare, which you can visit to this day, is known to have kept its sacred fire burning for more than a thousand years. The Irish government decided this year that February 1 will become a national holiday for Bridget on par with St. Patrick's Day. Mary Condren, a professor at Trinity College, is part of a group that has organized festivals for 30 years to honor Bridget. She said last week to the Irish Times journalist, she is seeking to, quote, liberate Bridget's traditions to empower women and bring about a new springtime in Irish spiritual consciousness, especially for those who've turned away from the traditional religious forms. I'm a minister. I always like to take a look at the liturgical calendar and that is it. In my personal calendar, I'm aware it is time to start turning my face to the future. It is not easy, I will admit, for me to think of leaving this community in June. But I know that it's coming and I know I need to prepare. We need to prepare. 
I trust the process that we are engaged in together here. I trust the work that we've done. You've done brave healing work after Manisha's departure, during COVID. I think and hope this community is the stronger for it. I trust the search process too. In the last couple of weeks, I've been able to speak with some of the ministerial candidates who are applying for the position. This is a standard part of the process. They'll call me, Manish, Roger, and perhaps Nancy to learn more about First Parish in Lincoln and what it's like to be a minister here. I've been so impressed by the thoughtfulness of their questions, the care with which they've read the very extensive documentation that the search committee has prepared. I'm not allowed, of course, to make any comments on any candidate to you or to the search committee, but I can tell you that I've been heartened by my conversations. I share the hopefulness and excitement I see growing in your search committee as they have vetted, reviewed, interviewed hour on hour on your behalf in January. There are good things in the works for all of us. So today I want to say a word about joy. We need physical wellness and spiritual gladness if we're going to get through COVID, the minister at Boston University's Marsh Chapel said the other week on the radio. And I liked how he said it. But spiritual gladness, wow, that can feel pretty hard to come by in these days of winter cold and COVID sameness. Still, I think he's right. We do need wellness and gladness, not just to get through COVID, but to start to heal and recover from the last two years. It's gonna take a while. Listening to another cleric recently, this time a Catholic priest, Joy isn't something that just happens to us, he said. It's a choice we make every day, a conscious choice. Now I know there are times in our lives when we are in physical or mental pain, serious bouts of illness, depression, which can make joy a pretty hard ask. And I respect that. I'm not suggesting that we try to do the impossible. But in some ways, as one of you said to me this week, setting that intention, trying to kind of decide ahead of time that I'm gonna look for joy today, or I'm gonna find something to get excited about, that can change our own orientation and really have an impact on us in our days. As Teilhard de Chardin said, joy is an infallible sign of God's presence. Deschardins was a French scientist, a paleontologist, and a Jesuit priest. So as the years go by, I try to look more and more for what gives me joy. I try to pay attention. I try to notice. Because I do think that's the direction the divine one is calling me. Not in the direction of more shoulds, although duty, task, responsibility are a part of every adult life, of course. But I'm imagining that the sacred one doesn't desire for me any more shoulds. She knows I've got plenty of those already, but instead desires for me a little bit more joy. And this could be something big, but a lot of the time it's something really small, like a really good cup of coffee or baking a loaf of bread and having it rise. That happened this week. <laughs> what a thing doing a craft that I love or playing a new game. What if you mentioned Wordle this week as something that gives you joy? And I heard a whole radio show on NPR like a day later about Wordle and how much joy it's bringing people. Getting onto skis, skates, bikes, boats, shooting hoops, only you knows what lights you up. If joy feels like a little bit of a stretch right now, a little out of reach, I'm thinking of what C.S. Lewis talk said, he said that we humans are quick to forget what he called the law of undulation. Troughs, peaks, troughs and valleys, peaks over and over again. And how he thought that the actually the divine could do some pretty good stuff with us when we were down in one of those troughs. And so I want to tell you about a winter long ago, a winter of difficulty and loss and sadness for my family and how something of joy grew out of that winter and has been with me ever since. 
The winter that I was 10, my mother became ill. Now we would probably call it a mental health crisis or something of that sort. Back then, I'm not sure anyone put any words to it. All I knew was that she took to her bed and she stayed there. She was for a time lost to us. My sister started cooking dinner and my father found part-time household help. And I drifted around our big old house after school at sixes and sevens. Until one day to escape the emptiness at home at the invitation of the old lady who lived across the street, I went to Mrs. McPherson's house and she taught me how to sew. There are so many things I don't remember from my life, but how many years later can I still remember the high ceilings and oriental rugs, how clean and still it was in her house. We were a family of five and three noisy little ones. What her house smelled like and how the sun fell on the floor of the little parlor upstairs where we would go. I can remember the pins in her mouth as she taught me to lay out tissue paper patterns and how to pin it down. I can remember the stale smell of her breath. Mrs. McPherson was not warm and cuddly. She was small with snow white hair, a spare frame and kind of a sparse way about her. She didn't talk very much, but when I arrived, she would offer me a brownie or some lemonade and then we'd go upstairs and get right to it. Pinning, cutting, stitching. It was like magic to me, making something out of nothing. Some thread, a little cloth and voila, a new apron for my mother a new skirt for me. That winter, when things seemed to go topsy-turvy in our house and my dad grew quiet and everything seemed confusing and sad, I walked across the street to the big yellow house and I learned how to sew. For a little while, I rested in the sanctuary of learning a new thing that brought me joy. It wasn't a big deal. There was nothing extraordinary about it. The kind gesture of a neighbor who maybe sensed that something was a little bit wrong across the street and wanted to reach out. She offered a small thing that she could offer, something she knew how to do. I wonder now if maybe she was lonely. I know that I was. Two lonely people and a blessing born out of a time of disruption and loss. Mrs. McPherson and I, we found one another that winter turning into spring. And out of that time, something new was born, something new that would bring me joy really for the rest of my life. Yes, the ability to sew, but more than that, the ability to be still, to let time slip away, to allow myself to become absorbed in something that took focus and concentration on the one hand, but let my mind and spirit slip, slip free on the other, to roam and muse, to meditate, to contemplate, dare I say, even to pray. As I said, she probably didn't think she was doing much of anything. A few afternoons, some brownies, lemonade, Something was born that winter turning into the spring that I meditate on now so many years later and recognize as one of the great gifts of my life. Because when I look back over my life, I see that when things turned difficult for me, I would often pick up something. I would make something by hand. It's been a way of coping of rowing myself across water when it gets choppy, a way of getting through. I remember an ugly gray sweater I knit for my sister when I was 20 something, navigating the rough waters of identity formation, depression and eventual vocation finding. Or the scrappy quilt I sewed right after Rich and I were married and he went to El Salvador as a journalist in a country where death squads still roamed and there was a war on. 
or the fuzzy yellow baby blanket I knit when we were waiting for Nicholas, the baby born half a, a world away, our son, but who couldn't come home to us yet. Those were long, hard months to wait. Over and over in my life, I notice that when anxiety bubbles up or fear threatens to take hold or territory turns uncharted or equanimity is hard to find, I turn to that gift I was given so long ago, that winter, the magic of making something out of nothing, of working with my hands. What helps us get through? Each one of us has to find our own way and joy, a little bit of joy can be a great boon, I think. Those moments when time and ego drop away, when worries drop away, not completely gone, but put over there just for a bit to be picked up again later. I call it contemplative practice. Maybe you call it something else. It's a way I can get quiet, be still and try to get centered again. Connect with something bigger and more encompassing than my own little life. Call it spirit mystery, divine, God, call it what you will. When I work with my hands, I return to the power in which I live and move and have my being and find myself comforted, soothed, and strengthened for the living of my days. I return to something I learned long ago, a little girl who had exiled herself from a home where things were sad and strange, I returned to something and I am returned in some way to my own deep self. It isn't a magic cure or a fix all. It's just a moment, a God given moment, a chance to dip down into that hidden current of spirit, of joy that may get lost from time to time, but is always flowing just there, out of sight, below the contours of my life, like the water that flows under ice in the woods as winter starts to turn into spring.